for him and Claire more. And he's going to have to deal with us for a lot longer, isn't he? (laughs) It's awesome. If you guys got your Bibles, go with me to Luke chapter 15. And uh, we're going to, we're going to, I want to talk to you a little bit uh, about the prodigal, the prodigal son. All of you, any of you that have been in church long, you've heard the message on the prodigal son. But I promise you, I'm going to tell you some things that you hadn't seen before. Okay? Scout's honor. And if I don't, you can beat Pastor Rick. <laughs> oh. All right, here we go. Luke, Luke 15. Uh, and you guys understand Jesus came. One of his significant reasons for, for coming into the earth was he wanted to show us the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen the way I act, that's how the Father acts. If you heard what I've said, that's what the Father would say. So not only did Jesus come to redeem us, but he came to introduce everyone to the heart of his father. So this message is giving us a glimpse or a picture, a window into the heart of God toward you and toward me. 15, let's pick up an 11. This is the new international version. Jesus continued, there was a certain man who had two sons. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate or my inheritance. He divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger one got together all he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, it was an extremely dishonorable ask for the younger son to ask a living father for an inheritance. The inheritance would come at the father's death. But before his father's dying, he said, I want my inheritance now. The father, not being harsh, allowed him to have his inheritance. He gathers up his stuff and moves away. He moves to another country because in a a Jewish context, he can't live that way and people not know him. Because the the nation's made up of tribes and we know each other because we're all somehow related through Jacob. So... He gets his, his money together, goes and, and squanders it. King James says he squandered it in riotous living. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields, notice this, to feed pigs. Jewish people not only don't eat pig, don't eat pork, but they don't have anything to do with pork. Now, we Gentiles, we're a little different. We like us some bacon. We like us some sausage. How about some pork chops? Come on. Yes, yes, yes. We sanctify it and eat it in the name of Jesus, right? So he went and fed him. He, he was so hungry, he went and fed some pigs. 16. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. Everybody say, no one one. gave him anything. anything. Now, let me tell you something about prodigals. A lot of times, if we're not careful, we, because we're good hearted, we, we have a tendency to turn our charity into toxic charity because we prolong someone's pain from actually hitting bottom, coming up and moving back toward God. I had a friend of mine, a good friend, who, whose school was doing really good. And the guy rose up in his community with another Christian school and started competing with him. Well, after about five years, that Christian school really began to de- deteriorate and was about to get out of money. Well, this guy's good-hearted. So he, gave, he bailed the guy out financially. Five years later, he's really a, a pain to this guy. And he was telling the Lord, Lord, this guy's become a pain to me. And the Lord spoke to him and said, five years ago when you gave him money, he was about to hit bottom and I was going to deal with his heart and he was going to humble himself. But because you bailed him out, he turned the thing around and he's going to be a pain to you because you bailed him out. Now, here's the thing. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we turn our back on people. But sometimes we need to pray before we give people money. And sometimes if we're not careful, we become codependent and giving people money that just prolongs their illness, prolongs their 
addiction prolongs their being away from God. So no one gave this, this boy anything. Watch what happens because of that. He's feeding pigs. No one gives him anything. Look at verse 17. When he came to his senses, there's something that awakens in you when you have nothing. He came to his senses. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have no food or have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out, go back to my father, say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up, went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him. So that means... His daddy was looking for him. You don't see someone a far way off if you're not looking for him. So he's looking for him. Now, this this father's representing God to all of us. Anytime we've ever been away from the father, the father's looking for an opportunity. As we draw near to him, God draws near to us. So the father's watching for him, sees him a far way off. Watch this. And his heart is filled with compassion for him. A lot of people think God's going to tee you up and knock you into next week. That God can't stand you. You've been away from God. He can't stand you. You're, you're miserable to him. How many of you glad God's bigger than all of our sins? Amen. How many glad God's bigger than all the sins of Claremore put together? Amen. How many glad Jesus died and was punished for all of our sins? Amen. That God's love for us is unconditional. That means you can't put a condition on it. You can't remove his reasons because your sins have nothing to do with his heart. His heart is benevolent toward all of us. His heart is abundant in compassion toward all of us. So his heart's filled with compassion. He sees his son coming. One translation says that when he saw him, he saw his son wearing beggar's clothes. So Nala, could you imagine? He's got beggar clothes on and he smells like pigs. And he's coming and his father sees him and says, that's my boy. I can tell the way he walks his gait. That's my boy. Takes off running after him. So the boys, you can imagine, he sees daddy coming and he's like, I'm getting my little speech. I'm getting my little spill ready to go. I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him. Watch what happens. Verse 18. I'll set off. The father sees him. And he says in verse 18, I'll go back to my father. And he says, father, I've sinned. So in uh, verse uh, 20, so he got up, went to be with his father. And while it was still a long way off, his father saw him filled with compassion for him. Watch this now. He ran to his son and kicked him in the seat of the pants, slapped him on the head, <laughs> told him, you've disappointed me. You've used all of our money. What in the world? You're a, you are so disappointing to me. No, that's not what the Bible says. Now, that's what a lot of us think. Right? It's like the father. Many of us in, in, in high school were required to read a Hemingway book called The Capital City. And in the story, the father and his older teenage son have a significant rift and the son moves away. Ten years pass. His son's nearly 30 now. And the father realizes, crud, I let my anger, my issues get me. And he started to pursue to find where his son was living. He had heard he was living in the capital city of Madrid. So he went there, looked through the city, looked through every public place and couldn't find him. So he takes an ad out on a Monday and says, Friday, meet me at the newspaper office. This is your father. Paco, will you forgive me for the way I treated you and mishandled you? If you have it in your heart to forgive me, meet me at 12 o'clock on Friday. Every day the ad went out. That Friday he showed up. In front of the newspaper. And there were 500 Pacos. Here's the point. Humans need forgiveness. Humans want forgiveness. But many times we're unwilling to admit that we got any wrong. I'll tell you the greatest person is the person like our father God. Who has no wrong. And yet is willing to love and forgive. Would to God we could all be like that toward our children. Can I hear a little stronger amen? Amen. Look at the person next to you and say, I know he's talking about your family right here. I know it. It's your family. So when the father shows up, runs to his son, watch what it says at the end of verse 20 again. 
says this, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, his spill, father, I've sinned against heaven, against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just throw me over there with the slaves. Treat me like a slave. But watch 22. But the father said to his servant, not even respond to the son. Now, let me say something to you. It's right for us to repent. It's right for us to apologize. It's right for us to say, I'm sorry to God and to people. I want you to know how ready God is to forgive you. He's so ready. First, he runs to you. (laughs) He gets to you. Instead of kicking you, thumping you, slapping you, popping you, he throws his arms around you and goes, Daddy, 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 I'm not worthy to be called your son. I've sinned against heaven and against you. Throw me with the slaves. You know what the father says? He says to the servants that chased him out there, quick, go get the robe. Notice what it says that actually in the scripture. It says 22, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring me the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandal on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate somebody. Come on, come on, come on. God celebrates when we really from our heart return home to God. Can I tell you, before the second coming of Jesus, there's going to be a second coming of prodigals. They're going to rush into the church that will love them. They're going to rush into a church that accepts them. And not only that, they're going to become powerful people in the community and the church. They're going, to, they're, they're going to become great if the church will love them. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Verse 24. The father says, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. So he began to celebrate. Now, here's what I believe and I'm praying for. I'm praying for a, an awakening to come over our cities. To where people that, are, that have known the Lord, received the incorruptible seed inside of them of Jesus Christ. There's a seed of eternal life inside of them, but it's been covered up. With a lot of sin and and departing from God. But there's an awakening coming where they wake up. They come to their senses and realize, man, it was better when I was serving God. It was better when I was walking with Jesus. I'm going back. What church can I find? Oh, I found that that church has has got to remodel that place. Man, I hear good things about it. I'm going to go there. And they come one Sunday. And they meet people at the door that love them. Say, come in. Come on in here and have a donut. Have some coffee. And they, and they come in, they're like, man, people are acting kind of happy around here. They're kind of acting like the people I smoke dope with. I mean, these are, they're just a little happy around here. Well, we're high, though, but we're high on the most high. Come on, right? So the, they come in here and they find grace and they find help. So the, the father's happy. My son that was once lost is now found. He was once dead and now he's alive. That's what happens next. So they begin to celebrate. 25. Meanwhile, the older brother, the older son, was in the field. Showing me he's working. He's steady. He's faithful. When he came near to the house, he heard the music and dancing. And he called to one of the servants and asked him, said, what's going on, man? What's the party? What's going on? 27. Your brother has come home, he replied. Your father has killed a fatty cat because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry. Kick the tires, fussed, cussed, got mad, refused to go in. I'm not going in there to my father's party. So the father went out and pleaded with him. Now watch this. Our heavenly father loves the prodigal. And he brings him near, kisses him, gives him the best robe, ring, shoes, party. The older brother, he's not happy about it. God, you're just being too good to him. He's a knucklehead and you're being good to him. Y'all with me? So the father has to go out to him and he pleads with him. Our heavenly father pleads with some of the older brothers and sisters in this room. And he answered to his fathers and he said, Father, look, look, let's, let's, let's consider this. Let's reason together. Look, all these years I've been serving you and never disobeyed your orders. Watch this. God never contends and says you're wrong. He was actually accurate. He'd served God. He'd been faithful. 
And the son says, you never gave me even a young goat. Forget the cow. You didn't give me a goat. Now, we out here in this part of the world, we understand the difference between a goat and a cow. Yeah. And, the, and the cow's better. One, because there's more meat. But you see, you didn't give me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours is who squandered your property with prostitutes and other took our inheritance as Christians, took the inheritance of grace and went rent running off and lived like the devil, lived like the, the, the people that are not like us, mistreated your property, mistreated your inheritance with prostitutes. Now has come home and you killed the fatted calf for him. Watch the father's response. The father says to him, you've always been with me, son. In other words, you're right. You've been faithful. You've always been with me. Then he says this is huge. Everything I have is yours. Let me talk to you, older brothers and sisters. We oftentimes want God to treat us like he treats baby Christians. Now, if you guys have been walking with God a while, you realize baby Christians get prayers answers. Almost they think about it and it happens. <laughs> they pray and I mean, dude, Shazam. Shamalama ding dong. They got their prayers answered. And now I've been serving God 25 years. I've been faithful. Actually, I've served the same church for 39 years. Y'all, yeah. I've stayed at my station 39 years. And we want to bellyache because God doesn't initiate for us like he initiated for the prodigal. And the father says this, listen. I'm not going to initiate for you unless you want me to treat you like a baby Christian. Everything I have is yours. If you wanted a robe, go to the closet. You want another ring? Go to the jewelry box. You want, a, you want shoes? We got, we got scores, stores full of shoes. You wanted a calf? I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Amen. Go get whatever you want. Have a party. Celebrate. Enjoy because it's yours. You're waiting for me to create a party. It's all yours. Now listen to me. He wants you to take your inheritance and enjoy it and not wait for him to initiate. Wait for him to bring. Wait for him to create the party. For people that have been walking with God, you have a storehouse full of seed that you've sown in the ground of your labor, your service, your kindness, your forgiveness. When you've loved people, a lot of times we don't, we don't keep count like that and say, well, they forgave so-and-so and that, and that person really hurt them, but they forgave them. Heaven records it. Jesus said, the father doesn't forget one thing you do. Even to the point of giving a cold glass of water, you'll be rewarded. We, we sometimes don't take into account what heaven is recording that you've done for him. When you do it for this local church, you're doing it for Jesus. Because remember when Paul was persecuting the church, Jesus said to Paul when he appeared to him, you're persecuting me. When you mess with them, that's my family you're messing with. When you love his family and love his sons and daughters, you're loving him. So let me say to you, first of all, what the Lord wanted me to tell you today is, first of all, he wants you to claim whatever you need. Now, turn with me if you got your Bible to 1 Corinthians 3 real quick. Go real quick there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, and look with me at verse 21, and this is the uh, New Living Translation. They're going to put it up here on the screens for us. 1 Corinthians 3. Guys, I'm going to have you put it up there, and I'm going to read it right off the screens. Okay, look right here. It says... 1 Corinthians 3, 21, it says, don't boast about following a particular leader, a spiritual leader, because he defines it, the leader being, he said, don't, don't, don't boast about following a particular leader because everything belongs to you. Say this out loud, everything belongs to me. Belongs to me. Now say it one more time and mean it this time. Everything belongs to me. He said, don't boast about these particular leaders because everything belongs to you, whether it's Paul, who's a minister, Apollos, he was a minister. We don't hear a lot about him, but he, he was a gifted speaker and minister. And then Peter. We know Paul and Peter. You guys know they died the same day. 
in Rome, they both were killed. They were both going to have their heads cut off, but Peter asked to be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to be crucified like Jesus was. They both died the exact same day in history. Wouldn't it have been cool if we could have gotten to a time capsule and gone back as they were hustling Peter out of the jail and they're going to take him in there. And they, and Peter, they crucified upside down, but Paul, they cut his head off. But if we could have come alongside him and said, dude, I know you're in Rome and look at all these statues to all the different Roman emperors and Nero here, he's killing you. Look at all these different heads. But I want to tell you, Paul, I'm coming from the 21st century and the 21st century I've been in Rome, personally. I've been to Rome, and it's no longer with Nero. There's crosses everywhere. I want to tell you, Paul, all your sacrifices, you and Peter's sacrifices, there's churches all over the United States and almost every little community and little hamlet and village because of you guys' sacrifices. What you're about to endure right now, I'm telling you, it's going to pay off for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. So he says this, don't boast about following any particular leader. Everything belongs to you. Everybody say, everything belongs to me. Whether it's Paul, Apollos, Peter. Now watch this now. That's the ministry gift. God sent Pastor Rick and the Burke family to come 13 years ago and come and start this. Everything starts with a man sacrificing. Every, every time it starts, it starts with a father who sacrifices for his family, works two jobs so the family, for kids to go to school, so you can have an education that daddy never had. We live to make life better for us. We want our ceiling in life to be our children's floor. We want, we want a, our kids to take off off of the platforms that we built and that they would succeed way beyond us. That's the will of God. That's the heart of God. Jesus, the golden rules that we do unto others, what we wish people would do to us. Amen. And that's what we do for our children. And Pastor Rick was sent. But he said, don't, don't boast about that. Everything belongs to you. Whether Paul or Paul is when he says this now, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, this Sunday, or the future, next week, next month, next decade, next century. Everything belongs to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. One day I was reading that, and the Lord said, read that backwards. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, start in 23 and read it backwards. So it says it this way. They still got it up there. Jesus belongs to God. You and I belong to Jesus. Y'all with me? So because we belong to Jesus, read with me, go backwards now. Because we belong to Jesus, everything belongs to you. Because here's why. Jesus is the rightful owner of the earth. God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit created this planet. Before Genesis 1, then he created everything on the planet. They're the creators of it. They give it to Adam and Eve as a lease. And they said, you have dominion on the earth. You control it. We created it, but we're giving you the lease. Adam and Eve lost the lease to the devil. The devil became the little G-O-D of this world in Genesis 1. And he ran roughshod over humanity and humans all the way to Jesus. And Jesus was the first human he ran into. He couldn't tempt. He couldn't deceive. And he couldn't yield to sin. Jesus never yielded to Satan. And he never yielded to sin. He was the first human being that hadn't been beaten. And they killed him and they crucified him because Jesus permitted himself to die. But he also knew that I would die for man's sins and I'd be punished for what they should be punished for. Then I would be raised from the dead and out of his resurrection and his risenness, guys, he's alive today. He's the rightful owner of everything. And because we belong to him, everything belongs to us. You belong to Jesus, then everything belongs to you. Then, then what else belongs to me? Well, he defines what everything is that belongs to you. The future, the present, death, life, the world, ministry gifts. Do you know what the Father's saying to all of you? You've been with me. Everything belongs to you. Quit waiting for a party to be thrown by me. It belongs to you because I gave it to you. Can anybody in that room get happy? Let's clap because everything belongs to us. Come on. So here, here's where we are. First of all, as, as faithful sons, 
We got the prodigals. There's before the second coming of Jesus, the second coming of prodigals. They're coming in. They're going to start coming in. They're going to rush into churches like this. They're all over America. But there wasn't this church 13 years ago in Claremore. It's here now. And, and we're not going anywhere. You know why? Because our best days are ahead of us because the future's ours. Yeah. Yes. Is that, is that, you understand that? And, but it's going to take sacrifice. All of us are going to have to come, come together and make stuff happen. And then when you guys make this, this strip mall and this thing look beautiful, the parking lot look beautiful, and you bring your friends in there, and they say, you go to church here? You say, yeah, yeah, I, I, I own that. That's my building. Everything belongs to you. And you guys have Sweat and blood. You have money and seed and life and sharing in this place. It belongs to you. Bring them on your property. Let me take you over to my, my, my property. Because yeah. I'm in the father's business. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the sons in the father's business. Come on. Yeah. It's his business that we're in, right? Yeah. So th- the first thing that God wants you to know is quit belly aching that things aren't happening for you like it is for these young Christians. Mm. It's all yours. Mm. Second of all, when the prodigal starts showing up in big, big numbers, don't feel like you're left out. You're huge. You're important. Thirdly, the father, the, the older brother's like, I'm not happy about him being home. And the father looks at him and says, dude, you've been working hard. You said it. You've been working hard. You've been faithful. But there's been one of you. Your brother's come home. Now there's going to be two of you. You're going to have to get to share the responsibility. You're not going to have to work 14 hours a day. Yeah. More laborers yes. in the harvest. Are y'all with me? Yes. Well, he doesn't want us barking like a watchdog at the new people that are coming that we're finding out that are prodigals because we want to love them. Do you know a lot of churches don't grow? They say they want to grow. But they're not willing to do anything to make the church grow. What they mean is we want the church to grow, but we don't want to do a blasted thing more than we've ever done. And so if it means that we got to do something, no, I don't want the church to grow. But here you guys are a different breed. Because one, you've been loved so much. For God so loved me. It's like Jesus said, they that have been forgiven much, love much. Usually the most loving people in the room are the people that have the biggest debt (laughs) that God took care of. I know for me, I had so much debt that I can't believe he loves me. I can't believe he, I mean, I'm the prodigal. You, you, you do me, you're doing to me way more than I deserve a thousand times. And he said this to me. He said, I want you to pray like I want that, whatever you're praying about that, I want it a thousand times more than you do. Don't talk to me like I'm stiff arming you, like the Heisman Trophy winner, that I'm like, get back, get back. He said, I'm not stiff arming you. You're asking me to do what I want to do a thousand times more than you want it. Treat me like your father and your partner. Don't treat me like I'm withholding from you. Because God doesn't initiate things for us. Well, I just wish God would just, I mean, he's God. Just do it. Why are you waiting for me to ask? Why are you waiting for for me to believe? Why are you waiting for me to stand? Why are you waiting for me to be patient till it comes? Just Treat me like you do the prodigal. And he said to me, do you want me to always treat you like a baby? Do you know naturally every one of you that have raised children, your children at first will let you hold them, change their diaper and feed them. And all they do is lay around and look sweet and then cry. And we still love them. But if at 22 they were doing that, how many of you would say that ain't happening? Why can you say it and him not? That ain't happening. It's all yours. Well, you're not going to lay around and do nothing and be nothing and, and expect to have everything. 
Don't expect me to treat you like that. When you want to you be mature, don't act like a baby. That's number one. Number two, this is big. You guys that are older Christians and you've been serving God, we've got to be, welcome our family in. The father had to go out and plead with the older brother, come into the party and celebrate your brother. Welcome your brother home. I've welcomed him home. What the older brother thought is there was one little pie and already little brother's got half the pie. Now he's come back for more of the pie and I'm not going to give the pie. And the father looked at him and said, look, Bubba, everything I have belongs to you. God doesn't have one pie that he's got to share amongst all of us. He's got pie after 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 pie. There's pie in the sky. There's pie on the ground. God owns it all. And if he doesn't have it and runs out of it, he just goes and creates it and says, here's some more. If someone else in this room gets blessed, doesn't mean you can't get blessed too. Amen. Amen. So what he's wanting you to do, your future, your future is first of all, y'all go get it. God's not withholding it. He wants it a thousand times more than you. Secondly, he wants you to welcome the prodigals back and don't have this fear that you're going to lose out if someone else comes in and gets it. Can I tell you, the more you give... Do you understand spiritual hunger is different than natural hunger? In natural hunger, if I'm hungry, I gotta, I'm empty and i got to eat something. Spiritual hunger is the exact opposite. The more you eat, the hungrier you get. So if you don't eat, you're not hungry. Spiritually speaking. If you stop eating and participating and partaking of the things of God and the nature of God and the ways of God and the family of God, you start getting distant from God. So we've got to eat to be hungry. We've got to feed to be hungry. We've got to serve to be hungry. Our spiritual hunger, you got spiritual hunger now, it's not just bless me and my four and no more. You realize the blessing of God is a big circle, not a small circle, not just your little circle. It's not just me, us four and no more. These four walls and forget everybody else. It's the more we bring in, the more there is for all of us. The more we make happen with all the people and we accept and love the people that God's sending to the to, to this church, to Cedar Point, the more that we're going to all have. It's better. The bigger, the better. The lie is this. I don't believe in big churches. And I tell people that tell me that all the time. Neither do I. They're like, how so? You got a church that you had 6,000 people on Easter Sunday. We, my daughter was delivering, delivering uh, brochures for our Easter Sunday. And the guy said, he was washing his car. She said, you mind if I hang this on your door? And he said, what is it? And he, she said, it's from Faith Christian. We want to invite you to our Easter services. And he goes, how big do y'all want to get? Don't y'all have enough people already? And she goes, well, there's a lot of people that don't know Jesus. we got to reach everybody. And even if you do know Jesus, you probably know some people that don't know Jesus. So we need you to get to them. Right. Everybody say, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Everybody say, everything belongs, to us. everything belongs to us. And we're generous people. Yeah. We're going to accept all the knuckleheads. Everybody that, all the churches that don't want them, we want them. We want the broken. We want the depressed. We want the indebted. We want the, 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 the divorced. We want everybody that's hurting. We want everybody that we can help. We want the up and outers and the down and outers. We want all of them. Because we're going to love them, right? Let me tell you one story and then I'm going to close. My daughter, my youngest daughter, I'm at a, I'm at a meeting out of the state. And this prophetic guy says, you have, a, you have a child that is really discouraged. It's one of your daughters. They don't know me. It's the first time I'd ever met him. They said, one of your daughters is really discouraged because she wants to get pregnant and can't get pregnant. And she's discouraged. And the Lord wants me to tell you to tell her to stop being discouraged. She'll, be, she'll get pregnant in a few weeks. So he said, do you know who that is? And I said, honestly, I don't. But we were going to lunch. I said, I can find out in just a second. And I texted my wife and I said, which one of our daughters is wanting to get pregnant is really discouraged. And she said, she was text back, who told you that? 
How many know your wives? They're, they're inquisitive souls. <laughs> who told you that? And I said, a prophet prophesied it to me. And I don't know who it is. Who is that? And she said, I know exactly who it is. And it's Jocelyn. And I said, she's trying to get pregnant? And he, she said, yes. And she hasn't for months and months and months. And she's discouraged. And she's talking to me. She won't talk to you, but she talks to me. And she said, I'm going to tell her that she's getting, going to get pregnant in the next few weeks. I said, no, 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 no. I said, it was my word. I'm telling her. I said, you can be in the room when I tell her, but it's my word. So I get her husband and her. They've been married about a year. And so I said, this prophet said, I've got a daughter that's discouraged because she can't get pregnant. Is that you, Jocelyn? I already knew. Yes. He said, you're going to get pregnant in a few weeks. And I asked the Lord on the way home, why would she be discouraged? And he goes, I answer her prayer so quickly. This is the longest she's ever had to be patient. Sounds like to me someone's getting to move into the elder situation here. She's having to wait a little bit. So I told her her and her husband cried. My wife started crying. And I don't know about you guys, but when my wife starts crying, it affects me. All of a sudden I start crying. I'm like, what am I crying about? They're happy tears. So we all pray together. And I have good news today. That was about three months ago. She is currently pregnant right now. I'm 60 years old. I'm 60 years old. And I still don't understand how that happens. But somebody might tell me in the between services. Is that good news, church? I said, is that good news? How many believe things that you've been seeking God for. I've got a situation now that's two and a half decades old that I started seeking God about and still hasn't popped. The Lord dealt with me less than a week ago. And he said this to me. It's a big, it's big stuff. And he said to me, if you want what God wants, for the same reason God wants it, then you become invincible. And he said, you've wanted, you are this close to getting all your reasons and motives right. And he said, today I'm going to help you cross the line. And he did. And the next time I come to church here, I'm going to tell you the answer to that request that's so big. So before we leave, I'll, I'll tell you this. That, oh, goodness. That was just my ear that got ripped off. <laughs> I turned it off. There we go. A week ago, I was in Pakistan. And in Pakistan, we were guarded by 12 military with AK-47s. It was a total Muslim country. And most of the Muslim people are the sweetest things on the planet. But there are a few crazy people. So we had the, we had the military and their AK-47 for a few crazies. We go into this outdoor meeting that's been, they've been working on it for a year. And if you guys don't mind putting this picture up, there's, there's 100,000 Muslims in a one night meeting, the gospel is preached. When the gospel is preached, they sit down. When it offered the chance to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, 90,000 of those Muslims stood up and said, I want Jesus Christ as my Lord. <laughs> and did you know what got them? God loves you. The world is told, and they're all trying to appease angry gods. They've not met our God. They haven't met the loving God.